Good. Good. Thank you. It's wonderful to be together again. Some people wonder if uh, maybe we arrange these things, you know, to be together, but uh, we don't. Uh, it takes a pastor that uh, thinks of two of us and calls us to do the same thing. So uh, we get together about twice or three times a year, and uh, I like it, man. I like Marcus Whitworth, don't you? So uh, bless you and carry on, brother, and his good wife. They're from the great big city of Henrietta, Oklahoma. <laughs> that's where the whole world starts and stops is over there. So, hey, that's a good one. And I just want to say one more time, uh, thank the Lord for Noel George and his wife, Cherie. Uh, God bless them. Aren't you, aren't you thankful? The, uh, the Lord has smiled on the church to give you such leadership, and uh, they are, they're young <laughs> in, in my perspective of life, but uh, experienced, and uh, they didn't just start day before yesterday, so he's got uh, a lot of good uh, sense and wisdom, so hey, bless you all, and thanks for all you've done for us and uh, putting us up in the motel over here and letting us eat at least once a day <laughs> has been better than that, but uh, it's good. Let me just say to you uh, real quick, and then we've got to get moving right on into this tonight. <clears throat> uh, back, uh, I'm going all the way back when I was in college at Olivet Nazarene College University. Now, uh, in... Uh, my freshman year, it was uh, Chapman Hall and lived on the fourth floor. I uh, had a roommate by the name of Johnny, J John Davis, or Johnny as many would call him. And I held a whole lot of uh, youth uh, weekend events, you know, weekend revivals, youth revivals, uh, or whatever, wherever. And so did he. I had a, kind of an old beat up car and so did he. So we would uh, meet there in the room sometime just after lunch on Friday, and uh, we would pray uh, about the weekend, you know, where he was going, where I was going. And then we would grab hands and shake hands and, and say, I'll pray for you, old buddy, and I'll see you in here about midnight, you know, Sunday night, we'd come dragging in. And then he would say this every single time as we headed out, I'll see you here or there or in the air. And that riveted in my mind, I'll see you here or there or in the air. And uh, that's what I will say to you tonight. I'll see you here or there or in the air. If the Lord wants to carry us home, if the Lord would like to bring the rapture around tonight, I'd vote for it. <laughs> Lord, come on quick. It's just okay with me. I've got a deal with my wife that if the rapture happens, I'll meet her 10 miles up and we'll go on into heaven together. So uh, uh, such is the case. I bet I won't, I won't get uh, to more than just this far down this road, but my old buddy Johnny now doesn't quite know who's who and what's what. Uh, his mind has uh, slipped uh, in probably what is called dementia or whatever. And they have moved to Shreveport, where a couple of their kids are. And so once in a while, I call my old college roommate. <clears throat> and his wife, Joanne, will say, um, John doesn't even remember what he had for breakfast. But he'll, he remembers you, Jim. He's got your picture <laughs> in the bedroom up there on a dresser, and he talks to you every day. So uh, I said, put him on the phone. So old John will get on the phone, and it's all Olivet, you know. It, it's all back there. His mind is clear from 50 years ago. He doesn't know what day it is today, but then he'll say, hey, Jim, I'll see you here or there. Or in the air, <laughs> he's still saying the same thing. 
And uh, so bless you all, and let's be ready to go whenever the Lord calls us. And thank you uh, to Pastor and staff and Brockington Road, Church of the Nazarene. You have unlimited potential. It's unlimited potential here. You have a beautiful building, and I'm told it's paid off. Blessed be the name of Jesus. <laughs> I think part of my calling in life has to be to go to churches and help them to get out of debt. So uh, bless you for what you have done in that regard. And it's a beautiful sanctuary. It's a, a beautiful uh, accommodations around with the rooms and the fellowship hall, the whole deal. So just keep focusing in on reaching people, people for Christ, people for Christ, uh, any, any kind of folk, old folks, young folks, middle-aged folks, married folks, single folks. I used to see people, you know, when I was trying to get the churches to go and grow, and I would say to them, we're looking for people like you. They'd say, oh, really? I said, are you alive? <laughs> If you're alive, we're looking for you. If you're dead, go on down the street. Go on down there. Okay. Well, uh, that kind of brings me around to this. <clears throat> I want to be part of a Jesus church. I want your church, our church, my church to be a Jesus church. Now, I know you don't know exactly what I mean by that, so... Let me just read a very short scripture. I'm not staying here. I'm just kind of jumping off from this one. From Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, the first gospel, chapter 4 and verse 23. Early on now, early in Jesus' ministry, this is what was said about him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease among the people. Teaching, preaching, healing. That's what Jesus did. If we're a Jesus church, we'll have a teaching ministry. We'll have a preaching ministry. We'll have a healing ministry. Amen? That's, that's what I call a Jesus church. Well, Matthew decided to say it again. So over in chapter 9, he just said it again. Chapter 9, and it is verse um, 35. Then Jesus went about all of the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. There it is. The three things again, I've got them all underlined here or circled, teaching, preaching, healing. And you know enough about Jesus, I trust, that that's what he did. It was teaching, it was preaching, or it was healing. What's wrong with our churches being Jesus churches where we have teaching, preaching, healing? I think in to some degree, we kind of got a little spooked about the healing part. Somewhere back about the uh, mid-1900s in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, I think there was a little excess in some other groups that healing became a little bit more than healing and became kind of um, a little bit of out-of-control stuff. And I'm afraid too many of our people backed away and said, oh, we, we, don't, we don't want all that kind of carrying on. I just want you to know <laughs> that healing doesn't just belong. Is it okay just flat out say this? Healing's not just a message of the Pentecostals. We believe in healing too. It's the Bible. Amen. Amen. And by the way, I'm not against the Pentecostals. They can win people to Jesus that we can't. 
So God bless them as they are doing what they're doing. God bless the Baptists as they're doing what they're doing. But God help the Nazarenes that we too will have a teaching, preaching, healing ministry. And that, in addition to the fact that I have been healed of cancer in the throat, <clears throat> causes me to be much more sensitive to healing than I ever was uh, in my, uh, possibly my first uh, half of my pastoral ministry. Boy, you go through something, and all of a sudden, you start to have a heart for others that go through that. Well, with that in, as the background, I would like to uh, turn all the ba way back now. I've got some ribbons here to try to help me to get to the right place. There we are. I want to go all the way back to Nehemiah because I found a verse in Nehemiah that is an echo of a verse from Deuteronomy. So if you have your Bibles, uh, get Nehemiah there. It's page 433, <laughs> whatever it is in years. And I was preaching through Nehemiah, which uh, was about a, a six-week endeavor. And I got clear to the end. This is uh, the last chapter, 13. And I read this little verse. Well, I guess there are, are two verses, but it talks about the fact they were reading the book of Moses and they were reminded about something terrible that had happened in their past, and that is when the children of Israel needed help. They needed a friend that these uh, Ammonites and Moabites would not help them. They did worse than that. Now verse 2, because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. There's one more verse. Underline that, or if you don't have your Bible, make a note and go home and find it. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. God is still doing that today. He will turn the curse, whatever that means, into a blessing. Well, I want to read the verse from Deuteronomy to you, which, it, which was the first one written, because that's an echo verse, at least the way I say it. And it's there, Deuteronomy, it's chapter 23, talks about the Ammonites and the Moabites. It's telling the same story. They did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. They hired against you uh, these and those and the others to curse you. Now listen to this. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Oh, oh, that's a good verse. That is really, really good. The Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Mm -hmm. Boy, that'd be worth writing down somewhere and putting it at home on a mirror or, you know, on a card on a mirror or wherever. The Lord can turn the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord, your God, loves you. I just want to give you an Old Testament story that I will have to, and, and I'm going to try to really condense because it's too long otherwise. I will give you one illustration from the New Testament, and then I'll try to give you an illustration from today, okay, on how God turns the curse into a blessing. The Old Testament story is Joseph. And if I start reading the scriptures, it'll, it'll take too long. If, you, if you're going to preach on Joseph, you need a month. It's, uh, so this is super abbreviated. <clears throat> Joseph was one of the 
uh, of the 12 children, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob was his father, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and then the sons. Joseph was a son of Jacob's old age or older age, and he developed a special love for him, which made his brothers uh, jealous and angry. And he even gave Joseph a special coat of many colors. Well, that didn't help the brothers to like him any better because it seemed that the father favored Joseph. The brothers all took the flocks of sheep and whatever they all may have had, cattle maybe, and they headed out to find pasture over there, beyond there, over there, and further than that. It was not just next door. It was uh, they were to be gone for some while. And after a bit, the father said to Joseph, uh, I'm sure take these things and go find your brothers and see if they're all right. Come back and tell me. I'm sure he took them a, a sack of, uh, of cookies. <laughs> I don't know, but I think he did. And so Joseph took off and did what he was told to do. The brothers were far away, and they got to talking about this brother that they rather hated. One of them said, if he shows up, Let's just kill him. That'll take care of him. And I tell you what, I've got a little plan. Let's take that lousy coat, if he's wearing it, and let's kill the kid. And then let's kill a lamb. And then we'll squeeze the blood on the coat. And then we'll go tell dad. Well, I guess the animals got him because we found this coat, and that's Joseph's, and I guess a wild animal got him. So that was their plan. Well, about that time, he came over the horizon. Here comes that dreamer now, they said. This is all out of Genesis, because Joseph also had dreams that they didn't like. Here comes that dreamer now. Let's get him. One of the brothers said, I've been thinking about this. There's a pit over here. Let's throw him in the pit. Don't kill him. He's our, he's our brother. And so they, he came to be a blessing, but they grabbed him and threw him into a deep pit. Now, in the way I'm thinking tonight, that's a curse. See, that's wrong. That's a curse. They, they did wrong to their brother. And then in a bit, uh, some travelers came by on the way to Egypt. And they, one of them said, hey, let's sell the kid. Sell him like a slave. So they pulled him out of the pit, sold him to travelers who ended up going to Egypt. And, and that's a curse. He got to Egypt and they just put him up for sale just like a slave because he was. And Potiphar, who was kind of a big man in the, in the government, government of the day, um, Pot Potiphar bought him and took him home. Found out that Joseph was very bright. And this is all in Genesis. I, I should be reading it, but uh, he, uh, he was very good looking. He did not have any blemishes at all. He was strong, sharp, and all of a sudden, yeah, everything they asked him to do, he did it better than anybody else. And first thing you know, he ran Potiphar's whole operation. Whatever that is, we'll leave it right there. And then, so all of a sudden, Joseph had risen to a pretty prominent position. Then uh, Potiphar had to take a trip. And he was gone for a long time. <laughs> this is where the story gets a little bit delicate. Potiphar's wife took a liking to Joseph. Mm. Joseph, old buddy, mm. you are some fine-looking young man. Mm. My husband's gone. 
for a long time. I've got the bedroom all ready. I've got the candles lit. I've got perfume around. Joseph, come on, old buddy. Come lie with me. That's the Bible word. <laughs> we got a bunch of teenagers here. They would say, come have sex with me. <laughs> okay, I said it. I got it out. Praise God. I'm not going to say that 10 more times tonight. <laughs> That's some of the, well, anyway, I'm not even going to stay there. And Joseph said, no, no, should I sin against my God and against my master? No. The Bible says, now, folks, check this out. I'm giving it to you. <clears throat> she came to him day by day. Mm, Joseph, old buddy. Mm, I've got the bed all set up again. Come on, old buddy. Come on, man. No. Finally, one day, now, folks, this is in the Bible. I keep saying that. This is in the book. She grabbed him, and he had some kind of a coat on. And she grabbed him and got the coat. <laughs> and maybe I'll, I'll rip this off. I'll rip my coat. But anyway, she got the coat. Now, this is not in the Bible, but the essence is, you got the coat, woman, but you don't get me. And he took off on the run. And she had his coat. Amen. Is there an amen in the house? I'm not making this up. And Joseph took off on the run. God bless him. <laughs> some woman's going to trap you. You better run. Or some man's going to trap you, you lady. You better run. Okay. And uh, then the Bible says that after he left, then she became angry and started to scream until her servants came in. What's the matter? That Hebrew uh, that my husband brought in here, that Hebrew tried to force me on my bed and I screamed and he ran, but I got his coat. That's a lie. That's a curse. Amen. That was a lie. Well, they believed her, of course. Then Potiphar came home, and she said, that Hebrew that you brought in here, he tried to force me and push, push me down on the bed, and I screamed, and I grabbed his coat, and he's gone, but here's his coat. Potiphar grabbed the, uh, Joseph and threw him in prison. Isn't that a great way to be treated after you did right? He did right, and he landed in prison prison for doing right. Boy, you can stop and preach there for a half an hour. What if you suffer because you do right? Mmm, that's a curse. Prison, especially when you've done nothing wrong. And two years he was in that prison. And now I'm jumping, uh, as you, some of you Bible teachers and scholars know, jumping over a lot. But the uh, king now started to have dreams. Nobody could figure them out. Finally, somebody said, I remember there's a guy. Well, he's a Hebrew young man. He's in prison. Uh, he, he interprets dreams because he did so uh, while I was uh, in prison also with him. And we'll get him out here. And he came out and he interpreted the dream. To make the big story real short, it was about... Um, uh, seven and seven. And the whole thing was there will be seven years of plenty and it's going to ha we're going to have crops in abundance and then we're going to have seven years of unbelievable drought and uh, starvation and it's seven and seven coming. And the king believed that because he described it right down to the detail. And so the king said, I'm going to put you in charge. And so he put him in charge of, of gathering all of the grain and storing the grain. And then the drought came and Joseph was in charge of distributing the grain to the people who would come because nothing would grow. God kept turning a curse into a blessing. Now Joseph's back up. He's, he, he was second to the king. God turned the curse into a blessing. Way over back in Israel, back in Canaan, 
they also had the um, drought. They also ran out of food. Jacob said to his brothers, by the way, they went home and said, we're sorry. We found Joseph's coat. Evidently, an animal got him. And so the dad had grieved and grieved and grieved because of his son having been eaten up by some animal, which was a lie. And they said, we've heard that if you want grain, food, you have to go all the way to Egypt to get it. And they, they have, a, they have a stored a whole bunch over there. Those brothers had to come and buy grain. And uh, they actually had to buy grain from the brother that they sold as a slave. But they didn't recognize him. And he kind of kept hidden anyway. And then when he revealed himself to his brothers, I'm the one you sold as a slave. And now he's in charge of everything except the king himself. The brothers were unbelievably scared because they said, now he's going to get us. Now he's going to get us. And then he, it, was, it was really good. Is your father still alive? Well, your father's my father. Well, go get him. No, he, he's too old. Well, then you don't get any more grain. Go get your father. Well, they had to go back and say, Dad, Father, mm, mm, we lied to you. Joseph's alive. An animal didn't get him. We actually sold him like a slave. Wouldn't that be one more tough time? Mm, uh, what? He, he said he won't give us any more food unless you come. They had to get old grandpa to go all the way over there to uh, Egypt. And there's this great big reunion, which is, oh, man, what a sight. And here's old, old granddad with his son, Joseph. And I mean, granddad, you know, in, in a manner of speaking because of age. And a, a reunion, which he thought for some years that he had been dead. <clears throat> And then granddad, uh, Jacob, died. Then the brothers said, now he's going to get us. Now that dad's gone, now he's going to get us. And now he's going to th- kill us or put us in prison for the rest of our life or something. And they came and they fell down on their knees before Joseph. And they said, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. Uh, just treat us like slaves, and, but, but don't kill us. And here's the verse. Here's the verse. The last chapter of Genesis, verse, chapter 50, verse um, uh, 19 and 20. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That is some scripture. You meant to curse me, but God turned the curse into a blessing. Amen? And uh, uh, then he said, "Uh, don't be afraid. I'm going to provide for you and your little ones. He gave them places to live and food to eat. I mean, it, it, this is way too much to try to toss into a, a message here, but Joseph was a type of Jesus. He was an Old Testament type of the Jesus coming who was, well, that's my New Testament illustration. Jesus, Jesus, the Lord, Jesus was God. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. It was God, man, together in what's called the incarnation. God came in a miraculous manner through the virgin birth of Mary, and Jesus was born in order to live and to teach and to preach and to heal, but he came to die to atone for the sins of all of us. The whole blood sacrifice thing is all wrapped up in all of that. And there's Jesus. He also did nothing wrong. He also didn't do anything but help people. They also grabbed him, didn't throw him in a pit. 
They started to beat on Jesus, and then they scourged him. Then they jammed a crown of thorns on his head, and then they put a robe around him and mocked him. Hey, you're the king, you're the king, yeah, 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 yeah. And they had hit him until his eyes were so swollen that he could not see because they would say, prophesy, who hit you? Whom? Another, another one of those old Roman soldiers would hit him. And then they took that Jesus, that Lord of ours, and they took him out and ultimately nailed him to a cross. And you know about that. And here, here they took that cross and took it out on a, on a hill. And well, this thing here, we'll just move it over here a little bit. And there Jesus was hanging on a cross on a hill called Golgotha. And brothers, sisters, teenagers, he didn't die in 10 minutes. It, it, was, it was terrible. Pain, agony, the whole deal. He had not done a thing wrong. The devil, in, in my manner of thinking tonight, the devil put a curse on Jesus, will kill you and see how you like that. And on a cross like you have up there, Jesus died. I'm sure Satan said, well, I've got that done. He's gone. They took Jesus down and buried him. <laughs> but on the first day of the week on resurrection morning, Jesus came alive, praise God, and broke out of that tomb. <laughs> and the women went to anoint his body if somebody would just roll the stone away. And when they got there, the stone was rolled away. An angel or two were there. Why, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. That's Easter. That's what we're moving up to right now. Easter. Jesus is alive. <laughs> Glory. What's my point? The devil meant it as a curse. God turned it into a blessing. Amen. Amen. Now, what is the symbol of Christianity around the world? It's the cross. It's the cross. That's our symbol. It was awful. That was terrible. That was a terrible way to die. But it has become the symbol uh, from the worst that could happen. Uh, God turned it into victory. Ooh, ooh it kind of blesses my heart. God turned the curse into a blessing. Most of you have a cross. Some of you ladies will have one maybe on a, on a necklace or maybe in earrings or maybe you've got a cross here or there. To, and there's a cross probably several in, in and around the church and, and you might have it in your Bible. I don't know. The cross. The cross is the symbol. Now, let me slow way down <laughs> and let me uh, put a little space in here. I don't want to offend anybody, but I want to say this. We do not have crucifixes in our churches because we believe Jesus is not still hanging on the cross. The cross is empty. And those who have a crucifix, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's another thought pattern. And I'm not here to beat them up. I'm just here to tell you our crosses, we, we don't have Jesus hanging on it because Jesus is alive, praise the Lord. <laughs> and that's kind of why we're Protestants, I guess I might, might as well say. Amen. It's okay. Amen. Amen. My whole point, God turned the curse into a blessing. God turned the curse into a blessing. And you go in, in, into the jungles of Peru, the jungles of uh, anywhere, but it happened in Peru, and you see three crosses up on these churches. They, they tend to use three, and the, the center one's the dominant one, and you know that's, that's a Nazarene church. That's a Nazarene church. They've got three crosses up there. 
That's the Nazarene church. <laughs> what is our symbol? It's the symbol of Christianity. A cross is not now the terrible, oh, no, the cross is now. Well, praise God. Jesus is alive. Are you, are you with me? God turned the curse into a blessing. Well, I better uh, carry on here. <laughs> oh, that's awful when, uh, uh, that's awful when it, it takes you a month to preach on Joseph and you have to get it in in 12 minutes. <laughs> and it takes us uh, all of Lent to preach on Jesus about and you try to get that in in 10 minutes. But I think you're with me. All I will say about me is I had cancer in the throat, and I'm not making it up. It was really, really bad. It was a hurtful cell tumor, and it was a five-and-a-half-hour surgery. And after it was all over, Dorothy and I, my wife and I, at the surgeon's office, Dr. Seth Reiner, a Jewish surgeon in Littleton, Colorado, and he took the stitches out and said to us, young man, it was full of aggressive cancer, and you have a problem. You never forget it when those words are said about you. I'm not, uh, I know I say this too much, but I'm not making this up. Dr. Seth Reiner, a Jewish surgeon who's still in practice, said, this would be a good time for you to get about 5,000 of those Nazarene friends of yours to go to prayer for you because that's where you are. Brother, when the Jewish brother says, you better get a prayer meeting going, you better get a prayer meeting going. <laughs> And some of you can remember back a few years when the word came that Brother Deal has got a cancer problem and it's in the throat. And it looked like that it, I had to have another surgery. And, I mean, I did have to have another surgery. <laughs> and it looked like I would not have a voice when, it, when they finished because he said I have to sign the waiver. Your voice may not be there. It may sound gravelly for the rest of your life. It may cut in and cut out and all of the rest. I went to a, in between surgery one and two, it was one month, it was the month of February. I went to the district superintendent's conference, uh, right, right where our district superintendent and his wife were, San Antonio, Texas, and on a Sunday morning, one of the brothers, whoever it was, called out when it was prayer time, why don't we get Brother Deal to come down and kneel and let's gather around and pray for the brother, he's got a cancer problem. And, uh, well, the general who was in charge that morning just looked at me and said, do you want to do that? I didn't even answer the brother. I just grabbed Dorothy and said, let's go. And we came down. It, this was not in a church. It was in a big hotel. And I knelt there, and they kind of pushed her over here, and the women gathered around her, and the brothers were all praying for me. I'm sure Dr. Branstetter was right there, and Gail was praying for Dorothy. And something happened to me on a Sunday morning in San Antonio. I could feel something happened in me, and I got up. And I know I was weeping, and I know that I started singing, and everybody started singing, and I remember the service that went on, and we were happy, we were blessed. You know, they were beating me on the back and hugging. And by the way, if you haven't been beaten on the back, come on, we got, you need another dip in the river, you know. <laughs> That's the way we do things, you know. And they were slapping, you know what I mean. And I sat down, oh, blessed be the Lord. I thought I was healed. Okay, two weeks later, uh, into, uh, yeah, into the surgery I went and opened it up, no thyroid left and whatever else, don't want to get into all of that. Came back and, and now we're sitting in the chairs again, took the stitches out. And here's the same doctor. And he looked at me and he didn't look very happy to me because I was expecting a whoa, 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 some kind of a big response. And he looked at me and he said, I've been to the lab myself. I've been to pathology myself. 
I've dissected your thyroid myself. I cannot find any cancer anywhere. And, uh, and I said, why are you so aggravated? And here's what he said. I saw it, and now I can't find it. And I said, doctor, don't you remember? You told me to get 5,000 of those Nazarenes to pray. They did. Now I know. Two weeks ago at San Antonio, uh, now I know. The Lord healed me. The Lord healed me. Now I know because you can't find it. You want to know what the good doctor said? <laughs> we'll see. Because <laughs> he couldn't take my word for it. So they put me through radioactive iodine 131 nuclear medicine. <laughs> Man, the first time I was hit with that, I was so nuclear or active and alive. They put me in a room in the hospital for 30 hours. I was isolated in this room. <laughs> I was. I bought a newspaper and read it all night. Didn't even turn the light on. Didn't have to, you know. <laughs> Playing with you, playing with you, just, just, just a little bit there. And they've done that to me four times with a nuclear medicine. And the last time I said, let me go. And that precious lady said, get out of here and have a blessed day. You're free. I think you can tell I, I'm okay. And by the way, thank you, Jesus, I can still talk. <laughs> uh, God turned the curse into a blessing for me. Amen? Well, um, amen. Let me, um, uh, let me see here. I, I, I don't think... I need to tell my wife's story tonight. But I was healed in my throat. My wife was healed from an unbelievable abusive past. And her first nine years were in an ungodly, terrible home with every kind of abuse you can imagine, including sexual abuse, that she locked in the cellar of her soul that no one would ever, ever know. By the way, her mother died. When she was nine, her father gave the kids away because he couldn't take care of them. I mean, maybe, maybe to a relative or maybe to somebody, but he gave the kids away. And the Nazarene pastor, who had been picking up, and, the, and his wife, I've been picking up two little girls out of those eight or ten kids in that, in that house. And the pastor said, we would like to have that nine-year-old. And we have a Nazarene family that will take the seven-year-old. And my wife walked out of that house with all of her belongings in a paper sack. And got in the back seat of a car. And her life forever changed. But nobody knew what was in the cellar of her soul until a few years ago our kids are grown and they're home for Christmas and uh, the grandkids are put to bed and our four kids with their mates gathered around and said mom what happened to you when you were a child? You have the classic signs of sexual abuse. What happened to you, Mom? That's a night we will never forget. That screaming started to come out of her soul, and she started to relive all of that. I don't think I'm going to take that any farther. I need to tell you, Dorothy has been healed. Praise God. Dorothy has been healed. Dorothy's my wife. She's been healed. If you can walk up on the platform when I 
finish a message at Denver First Church with a ton of people there. And she took the microphone and told her story with tears, but she told everybody. And then it created such a reaction of people that wanted to be prayed for that she had to start a Wednesday night ministry on healing from your abusive past and did that as long as we lived there. Every Wednesday night, she would take them for about three months and then take a break and then another group. So I was healed here. Dorothy was healed in her mind and in her heart. Do you believe that? Brothers, sisters, young people, that's healing too. Let me just quickly do this one because this, was all, this is altogether different, and I just want you to hear this, and then we're going to pray for God to heal whoever wants to be anointed and prayed for tonight. This is from USA Today. Are you aware USA Today is not a religious paper? <laughs> Amen. And evidently, a few summers back, they want, there was a baseball all-star time, and evidently they wanted an article from a former big-time, high-powered baseball all-star. So they sent a reporter out to go to the home of Daryl Strawberry. You've heard that name, Daryl Strawberry. He, he was uh, with the uh, Mets and with the Yankees. They walked into his four-bedroom, two-story modest house, and this six-foot, six-inch muscular-toned man welcomed them into his house, Daryl Strawberry. And I'm, I'm going to jump now and only read the, the parts that are highlighted here. Where are your pictures? Where are the trophies? Where are the plaques? Where are your four World Series rings? Where are, your, uh, where are the uh, memorabilia from your eight All-Star games? You hit 335 home runs. Well, where's one of them? Now, this I'm reading it out of the paper. Daryl Strawberry said, that former person is dead. They don't know it at USA Today, but that's good theology. <laughs> that person is dead. I'm sure they said, huh? He's what? He said, no, I'm just, I'm just reading the paper to you. He said, I, I got into drugs and then into alcohol addiction. And then he's told chilling details about crack houses and prison life. I didn't know the old boy went to prison. I didn't know that he was an, uh, an addict, either of alcohol or um, uh, drugs. And he, he wept as he told about the shame that he caused his family and on and on. And he finally got his treatment from or whatever and went to a halfway house and met there a young lady by the name of, um, come on, here's is in here, Tracy. And she was a born-again Christian. And she said, with the help of God, I'm going to lead that guy to Jesus. And she started in on Daryl Strawberry and led him to the Lord. And he has become a Christian. And he said, I love it that I was a great player and won championships and did all those things, uh, but I knew there had to be more to life than just putting on a uniform, hitting a grand slam home run, and making millions of dollars. Amen. There's got to be more to life than that. I always believe there is a greater purpose in life. I love the game. Don't get me wrong. But I love the Bible more, and I want to help people save their lives and so on and so on. Daryl Strawberry is a pastor today just outside of St. Louis. He's a pastor. He's a preacher. Oh, by the way, he married Tracy. <laughs> and there's her picture right there. And we're not into this for publicity, he said. We're into it because God called us into the ministry. We became what God wanted us to be. We're trying to bring purpose into people's lives and so on. We've had all the every issue that anybody could ever have. But he said, uh, this, I was a baseball all-star, fell into the pits, Having, uh, having everybody write you off, then having God say, I'm going to use your mess for a message. Ooh, that'll preach. 
How beautiful is that? I read that in the USA Today. I said, brother, I'm taking that baby with me. Daryl Strawberry was healed of addictions. And we call that deliverance. But that's healing. That's healing. So I just wanted you just to hear. That, you see, I was healed in here. My wife was healed in her mind and her heart and her body. Strawberry was healed from addictions and only God knows what. My whole point, God can turn the curse into a blessing. Amen. Joseph, Jesus, a whole bunch of you, the same thing. Well, time now. It's time now to say, we're just a bunch of Christians here that try to follow the word of God. And the Bible says, if there's any sick among you, well, let them come and let the elders of the church or the mature ones anoint with oil and the prayer of faith will save the sick. We just feel like that we ought to literally do that. So the oil, uh, I have a, a little vial here is not magical. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The person who prays over you is not magical because healing comes from God. Jesus is Lord. So don't glorify us. We glorify Jesus. Amen.